Hey guys, today we have a brand new battery from WattCycle, and this one is a beast. This is a 12.8 volt, 628 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery. Yes, 628 amp hours, a new record in the 12 volt category. That's over 8,000 watt hours of stored energy. These batteries keep getting bigger and bigger. This battery is roughly nine and a half inches in height, roughly 20 inches in length, including the terminals and handles, and roughly 14 and a quarter inches in depth. On the left side, we have our main positive and negative terminal. These are M8 bolts. This battery has a set of collapsible handles, one on each side, but at 139 pounds, I would strongly recommend uh, you support the battery from the bottom and you use two people when moving it around. This battery is rated for 300 amps continuous charge and discharge. It's rated for 6,000 cycles at an 80% depth of discharge, and you can connect up to four of them in series for a 48 volt system. I ran a capacity test using my American Reliance electronic load at 60 amps or roughly a 0.1 C rate. That is unfortunately the limits of this electronic load. It's rated for 800 watts maximum. I really do need to get a second one at some point. The resulting capacity was a staggering 669 amp hours or 106.5% higher than rated. Inside we have some epoxy fiberboard held in by four plastic clips. So it looks like we have eight cells total. So these must be 314 amp hour cells. They are connected in groups of two. You can see wired in parallel there. Four in series makes 12.8 volts nominal. The bus bars are laser welded directly to the cells there. They do have an expansion hump in the middle. They are aluminum and they are fairly beefy in thickness. The series connections are done with a second aluminum plate bolted down to the aluminum bus bars. The main positive and negative appear to be multi-layer aluminum. Here you can see we have approximately five layers, it looks like, of aluminum. There's a large support bracket across the top of the battery here, and it looks like there are steel plates on each end, which are then bolted to the case. I see a layer of fiber epoxy board down there and then some foam. It does look like this is clamped on pretty tight and the uh, brackets actually bent a little bit there. Our balance leads, temperature sensors and so forth come up the front here. They're all zip tied down to place nicely. They are soldered to what appears to be some nickel strip, which is then laser or spot welded to the aluminum bus bar. And it looks like every grouping of cells has a temperature sensor. So there's a temperature sensor here, 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 and there's a fourth one over here. Before we take this apart any further, let's try running a high current discharge test. For this test, I have a 3000 watt reliable electric inverter connected with uh, four aught gauge conductors. And for the load, we're just going to dump this energy into my main battery bank. And I'm gonna do that with two 48 volt chargers. Let's start a timer and turn the inverter on. And we're pulling about 247 amps there. We are a half hour into this test. 258 amps. And according to the Watt Cycle app, the hottest part of the BMS is at 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Let's go ahead and pull the cover off here. And it looks like the hottest part of the battery we're seeing is 87 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's on the location where we have these uh, nuts here. Uh, so we've got 112 degrees there on the positive terminal. And we have 115 degrees there on the negative terminal. Trying to get a straight shot down into the BMS here. I do see 122 degrees on the screws for the negative uh, bus bar that go out to the terminal. So overall, this is looking very good. Unfortunately, the test concluded at one hour and 23 minutes. I was in the next room monitoring the Watt Cycle app. I saw the MOSFET temperature hit 139 degrees, so I walked over to check on it. While I was walking over, the load shut off and I noticed the inverter was emitting a large amount of smoke. So I quickly disconnected it and threw the whole inverter and cable assembly out in the yard. Now this BMS is programmed to cut off at 140 degrees Fahrenheit, so I don't know whether the BMS cutoff was due to it hitting that temperature or the actual inverter failure. By the time I checked the app, these were the errors that were present. Based on this experience, I think we can conclude two things. Number one, the BMS in this battery did a phenomenal job at cutting off the current and ensuring the battery remains safe. Number two, I think a 300 amp discharge of this battery is not a very good idea. That said, I did run the thermal camera over this battery several times during the test, and I did not observe any overheating issues of the cells, the bus bars, or any of the connection points. All right, it's time to test the low temperature charge protection. So I have my bench power supply here, putting in 1.57 amps, and I pulled off the temperature sensor from the far right corner, going to spray it with some computer duster. 
it was about three and a half seconds and the charging shut off. So let's go ahead and warm the sensor back up again. 14 seconds and we began charging again. So the low temperature charge protection in this battery does work. I removed the positive bus bar and I removed the nuts from the negative bus bar. I removed two Phillips screws on the left and right of the BMS and there were two nuts down on the bottom. So now we should be able to slide this BMS out. Go, we're just stuck, okay. The bus bars are attached to the BMS with five bolts. These are actually some pretty nice bus bars. They actually have a lot of mass to them. Here's a closer look at the BMS. It is model 2024 LFP. There's a model number there. I don't really see any brand or current markings on it. I did search this part number here online and I could not find anything. I removed the screws from the bottom. Let's take it apart and see what we can find. So there's our thermal pad. Bottom piece. Wow, we got more FETs underneath. So here's the B minus, this is the battery side. Here is the P minus, this is the power side. Uh, our FETs are transistors for controlling the charge and the discharge. Again, we have an array on the top and an array there on the bottom. And I do see several large resistors here and several large resistors here, which are going to be the shunt resistors. That's how the BMS determines how much current is flowing through it. The control side of this BMS actually looks a bit more involved than we typically see. Uh, so here's where our balance leads come in. It looks like this has support for way more than 4S, uh, but we see two channels here with these two populated resistors. And then the bottom has the other two channels here. We have two computer chips of some kind here, but this large resistor has me a bit uh, baffled as to what purpose this serves. It doesn't look anywhere near large enough to be a pre-charged circuit. This is where the temperature sensors were connected and it looks like that data feeds into this chip here. Then we have our Bluetooth module here on the top right. Also of interest is a very small button cell battery here. This actually looks like a very nice quality BMS. I think we simply don't have enough thermal mass with these plates to dissipate the amount of heat that's being generated by these transistors. Also, I do believe this part located right here is the MOSFET temperature sensor, uh, though I could not locate the second temperature sensor on this board. We can remove this bus bar and this bus bar. I also removed one, two, three, four screws on the top, and there are also one, two, three, four screws holding this battery pack down to the bottom of the case. This is a very nice battery pack. These cells are pristine. Look how flat they are. So you can see the steel plate on the end there. Then we have three plastic bands holding the steel plate in the battery pack together. Again, we have a layer of epoxy board and foam layer. There's also some battery paper between each of the cells, keeping them insulated. Uh, there is nothing on the bottom of the battery pack. However, there is some epoxy board on the bottom of the case. Let's get this bracket out of the way very carefully here. We do have foam padding on the bottom of this bracket. Here's a top look at the cells. Again, look how perfectly flat they are. There is zero bloat to these cells. After conducting a bit of research, I believe these to be Batero brand cells, 314 amp hour cells. These cells are rated for 8,000 cycles to a 70% state of health at a standard charge and discharge rate of 0.5 C while being fixed at 300 kilogram force. So yeah, bottom line, these are very good cells. As you saw earlier, WattCycle does have an app to manage their batteries. It does not require an account to use. It is fairly basic, but effective. It allows you to see voltage, amperage, wattage, state of charge. You can control the charge and discharge functions. You can see the voltages of the individual cells. You can see the temperatures of all six sensors. It also allows you to view and edit certain BMS parameters. In conclusion, I think this is a fantastic battery that will hopefully last a long time. The capacity is simply unbeatable. If you get four of these and wire them in series for a 48 volt system, you'll have a 32 kilowatt hour battery. That is a lot of energy storage. That said, I don't think I'd push it anywhere near 300 amps discharge. Uh, it does seem to have a quality BMS. I think the heatsink is just not large enough to dissipate the amount of heat that's being generated. I may do another high current discharge test at some point, but I need to find a better inverter for sure. One suggestion I did take back to WattCycle is improved packaging and or freight shipping, you know, on a mini pallet or something. Uh, this battery was delivered FedEx ground transport, and guys, this thing is heavy. The box was wet and beat up by the time I took possession. I'm glad I was here when it was delivered. The driver was super nice. I helped him move it off the truck and into the garage. I have no idea how he would have unloaded this thing by himself. He didn't seem to have a hand truck or a lift of any kind. As always, please let me know what you guys think in the comment section. 
Please give this video a thumbs up before you go, and thanks for watching.